Good evening. I'm Richard Meserve, the president of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and I'd like to welcome you all to our first capital evening of this academic year. Tonight's event is co-hosted by Carnegie, the Royal Norwegian Embassy, the Norwegian Academy of Arts uh, of, of, of Science, uh, of Arts and Science, and uh, the Cavalry Foundation. It is an honor. Uh, it is to honor one of the win winners this year of the 2010 Cavalry Prize in Astrophysics. As I think many of you know, the Cavalry Foundation is an important new source of support for basic science, and it comes at a time when it's going to be vitally important to have some new sources of basic science that arise. And I'm very pleased that Fred Cavley, the person who established the foundation, is with us tonight. Fred, could you please stand? Before I return to introduce this evening's speaker, I would like to introduce one of our co-hosts for this evening's event, and that is Ambassador Stroman of the Royal Norwegian Embassy. Carnegie has been very fortunate over recent years to have collaborated with the embassy on a variety of activities. In fact, our building was filled over the past several days with the attendees at this year's Transatlantic Science Week, which is a wonderful event sponsored by the embassy that brings Norwegian and U.S. scientists closer together. We have greatly valued our relationship with the Norwegian Embassy, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to pass the stage to Ambassador Stroman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masur. Thank you very much for those kind words. Could I only say on behalf of Norway, there's a great joy to be, a to be associated with the Kavli Price and the Kavli Lecture. This has been a very good thing for us. Mr. Kavli, who you, <coughs> you, you saw, I'd like to recognize his presence as well, uh, was educated in Norway, came to California and to this country. And in a way to establish these prices and make it possible to, <coughs> to reach out, and this will be my point for the evening, the incredible potential that the price and these lectures have for reaching out to young people. For, to get them interested in science. We will experience tonight probably a very good or brilliant lecture by Dr. A Angel, and I hope that a lot of young people in Norway in other places will, will see it as well and be, uh, be inspired. This is something for the future. Thank you very much to the Carnegie Foundation for including us uh, in this. Thank you to Mr. Kavli to, for, um, for establishing the price and I look forward to listening to Dr. Angel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We generally think of mirrors in the context of the pursuit of beauty, the de decoration of homes. To astronomers, mirrors are synonymous with telescopes, in particular, a type of telescope called a reflector. In contrast to refractors, the type of telescope that Galileo pioneered and that uses lenses to bend, focus, and magnify light, reflectors use curved mirrors. The curved primary mirror of a reflector gathers light and reflects it back to a point of focus. Isaac Newton is credited, credited with building the first reflecting telescope in the late 1600s. Because mirrors are free of refractive dispersion, their imaging quality surpasses that of lenses. As a result, the reflector soon became the telescope of choice for most astronomical observatories. Newton's first telescope had a primary mirror of only six inches. But he and other scientists recognized that the larger the primary mirror, the more light it could gather, and thus the more distant objects it could detect. The resolution that can be achieved is also proportional to the size of the mirror. So the discernment of fine details also points to large mirrors. The first half of the 20th century saw the development of ever larger mirrors. When the Carnegie Institution installed its Hooker telescope with a 2.5 meter mirror on Mount Wilson in 1917, it had only been nine years since its predecessor, 
with a 1.5 meter mirror saw first light. But by 1948, the technology stalled when the Hale Telescope at Mount Palomar went into service with a five meter mirror, twice the diameter and hence four times the area and light gathering capacity of the 2.5 meter mirror. This seemed to be the limit. It did not seem possible to build a mirror larger than five or six meters. In the late 1990s, however, telescope mirrors began once again to grow larger, ushering in a new era of telescope design and a new era of astronomical discoveries. These advances resulted primarily from the innovative thinking of three astrophysicists honored this year by the Cavley Foundation, including our guest tonight, Dr. Roger Angel. The Cavley Foundation honored Dr. Angel in September of this year for his technique of molding glass mirrors in which the body of the mirror has a unique honeycomb design. These holes reduce the mirror weight dramatically while simultaneously providing the necessary rigidity. Dr. Angel first used this honeycomb technique in 1997 when he and his colleagues at the Stewart Observatory Mirror Laboratory at the University of Arizona cast an 8.4 meter mirror, the largest single mirror then made. This mirror serves as one of two primary mirrors in the large binocular telescope on Mount Graham. Since then, the Stewart Mirror Lab, under Dr. Angel's direction, has successfully cast many more mirrors, including the two mirrors installed on the twin Magellan telescopes at Carnegie's Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. His clever design will be applied in the construction of a telescope with a 25 meter aperture made up of seven eight meter segments that Carnegie and its partners are now planning to build. This giant Magellan telescope will also be located at Carnegie's observatory in Chile. Dr. Angel has been the director of the Stewart Observatory Mirror Laboratory for many years. He is also director of the University of Arizona Center for Astronomical Adaptive Optics and a University of Arizona Regents Professor of Astronomy and Optical Sciences. A native of the United Kingdom, he received his bachelor's degree from Oxford University, his master's degree from Caltech, and his PhD from Oxford. He is a Royal Society Fellow, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a MacArthur Fellow, and a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Astronomical Society. In, among his honors, in addition to the recent Cavley Prize, are the 2007 Joseph Fraunhofer Robert M. Burley Prize from the Optical Society of America, the 2006 Joseph Weber Award for Astronomical Instrumentation, and the 1976 Newton Lacey Pierce Prize. In order to detect faint objects, telescope designers have developed clever optical techniques to capture and use every available photon. Of course, capturing photons and using them efficiently is a key to the success of solar energy. Dr. Angel will talk tonight about his use of the techniques he applies to astronomical instruments to improve the efficiency of photovoltaic systems for solar energy recovery. Roger Angel is a pioneer in modern optics. His work has enabled astronomers to push further back in time and space, helping us all learn about the origins of the universe. He is now turning these same skills to meet our energy challenge. Please join me in welcoming Roger Angel. be here, particularly at, at uh, Carnegie. We've uh, worked together for a long time now, making these mirrors and telescopes better, and I think they probably work better in the Carnegie telescopes perhaps than, than anywhere, which is because it takes a lot to make the whole system work. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very glad that Mr. Cavley can be here as well. Very uh, grateful for the recent prize. I want to uh, you, know, you stole most of my lines. Which you got <laughs> I want to uh, say a little bit, uh, perhaps, that brings in you know, what it is that uh, the three prize winners for astrophysics 
uh, contributed, going a little deeper in that. So um, I will talk about uh, solar energy probably for about half the talk. Um, I want to say that um, I've sort of been pretty absorbed in the mechanics of telescopes, but I hadn't quite forgotten why I got into the swamp. And so until a few years ago, I was really interested in, um, you know, now that we've got evidence of planets and even one or two direct images of planets around nearby stars, uh, Nick Wolf, who I think is here, and I began to think, oh, 20 years ago, if there were planets like the Earth, uh, what would they look like? Could we image them? How would we know if we'd found a planet like the Earth? And it's quite interesting that the, the real giveaway that you have a planet like the Earth is if it has oxygen in its atmosphere. So we were figuring out techniques to be able to get a spectrum of another planet, and that required huge telescopes, telescopes in space. Um, and the spectrum of our own Earth, the greenhouse gases really slam out in the spectrum of the Earth. So if another planet uh, is, has greenhouse warming like our own, then you'll see the features of ozone and carbon dioxide and water very strongly in that planet. So this was of huge interest technically to figure out how to do that. Then you realize that in our, in our own planet, these same things that enable us to recognize other Earth-like planets are kind of going wrong in our own planet. And so if we saw another planet in our state, we would see that the absorption features of carbon dioxide were steadily growing. Um, and so I've, in the last few years, I've come to realize that perhaps looking for other planets for me can wait for a little bit. And it's time to focus on our own planet because the clock is ticking real fast. And so if we have anything to bring to bear on what to do about our own planet, and I, I'll try and convince you during this uh, talk that I think there's a lot that we've learned from making telescopes and astronomy that, that can be relevant. But I'll talk a little bit first about, um, let's make this thing work here. Um, so I wanted to, to thank my collaborators. You, this kind of a prize where it's for a huge team effort of telescope making, this is not like I go and sit in some room and figure it out, right? It's a huge enterprise with a lot of people. And some of the main people who kept me going and provided a lot of the ideas over the last 20 or 30 years, my former student, John Hill, who then became the director of the Large Monocular Telescope, Nick Wolf, who is here in the audience, who has uh, been a constant source of inspiration, Peter Strittmauer, who's my boss, who makes things run efficiently, and Eleanor Angel, who's my wife, and keeps me sane. <laughs> so we had a great time in, in Norway this summer. Um, the prize events are just terrific. I really enjoyed uh, being there and meeting uh, Fred. So another, I think this was the title I gave in Norway, was Te Telescopes for Enlightenment, which is using them for astronomy and telescope for energy. So during the day, we can point out telescopes that are rather large source of photons and hopefully use those to make energy. And then so we don't get bored at night, we can point out telescopes at <laughs> stars which may, where the light may have taken 10 billion years to get to us, and we only get one or two. But it's interesting, the same physics of detecting those very few photons from so very far away are exactly the things, if you figured out how to do that, then figuring out how to capture the huge number of photons from the sun, uh, everything is sort of the same, it's just on a different scale. Okay, so the thought is, and uh, then that, um, Telescopes may lead to the lowest cost renewable energy. Um, and that's, we'll come back to that. But, but let's talk a little bit, um, you know, some of you may be wondering, you know, what, what it was that we did could possibly justify getting this wonderful prize. Uh, certainly I wasn't ex expecting it. I'm still uh, thinking about it. Okay, so, so there's Newton and his telescope, um, the, the very first, uh, reflecting telescope. Actually, I think only one or two inches in diameter. Um, but it, it got over some of the problems of refractors. 
And over the years, I think that's 1672, by 1845, uh, telescope mirrors have got up to six feet in diameter, and this is the one in, in Ireland, the uh, Ross telescope. And there's this wonderful drawing of M51 made with that telescope. So that's light that took 23 million years. Is that right, Wendy? Something, something like that, I think, <laughs> to get here. So in, in those days, all you could do was look, at, look with your eye, and the only way to see really faint was to get bigger. And of course, now this is the Hubble telescope picture of the same galaxy. You can see that the drawing from 150 years ago isn't, isn't so bad. Um, it's still the same game if we're going to look very far away. We just need ever bigger telescopes. And as, as we'll see, we also get higher resolution. So there are two whammies for going bigger, which is why we astronomers are also always so greedy for, for more aperture. So that's the, the mirror that was used in the Ross telescope. I, it's, it's a great comfort when you get into the telescope making game to remember that Galileo did it himself, and Newton did it himself, and Herschel did it himself. He made mirrors like this. I think he made a 48-inch mirror. And there's a wonderful story where he's melting the metal and pouring in his basement, and the mold leaks, and there's liquid metal on the flagstones, which start to explode, and they have to run away there. So a, a lot of astronomers, through until quite recently, were very much engaged in how to make a telescope, because it, it takes quite a lot of a lot of finesse to, to get it right. So um, after 1850, there was a switch which allowed reflected telescopes to be much more powerful. And that is, instead of polishing metal, which is what Newton did, if you want a shiny reflecting surface, then you would polish it into metal. But the metals they use, speculum metal, is very much like pewter. And you know what pewter does after a few years, right? It turns black, and so you have to constantly repolish these, these things. And it's not like you just get out a rag and rub on it. If you do, you'll kind of, at the scale of accuracy you need for a telescope, you'll gouge grooves in it just by rubbing with a rag. So when you have to repolish metal, it's a very serious business with a lot of testing, and, and so really painful. So that, the people who did make those big reflectors were incredible. Uh, technicians to, to keep their, their telescopes polished. Anyway, glass is wonderful stuff because it has this property, you know, the molecules are not in, in the arrays that can shear and dislocate and, and move, like steel, for instance, gets all its strength because it will move a little bit. So glass is all locked up in a non-regular structure, so it cannot change its shape. The only thing you can do with glass is bust it or else it's going to keep the same shape. And the Mount Wilson mirror, after 100 years, has still got identically the same shape that it had 100 years ago because glass cannot change its shape. So that's really good. It also doesn't corrode. It keeps a real nice, shiny surface for 100 years. So the only thing it's missing is a, that it doesn't have a shine or a really bright shine like metal. Um, and uh, Liebig and other people in around 1850 figured out chemistry to put a beautiful shiny layer of silver on glass. Now that deteriorates too, it, it'll turn black in the end, but then you just wash it off and put on a new layer. So you don't have to be a genius to recover the nice shiny surface of a glass mirror. So that uh, took reflectors forward and through the telescopes, uh, Carnegie's telescopes, the 60, the 100 inch, and then the 200 inch. Um, and then there did seem to be a hold up and uh, basically, I think the, uh, the, the prize winners, the three of us, sort of really tried to found ways to break through beyond this four to five meter limit that we were stuck at until around 20 years ago. Let me tell you why, why people got stuck at that point. If you make something really big, it has to be really thick to get the stiffness that you want. And if you make, so you, you could do that, and people even found uh, glass as a, as a problem if you make something really thick. That is, it never comes into thermal equilibrium. When things cool down at night, the outside of the glass may go cold, but the inside stays hot. And that will cause a distortion in the shape. 
So um, in the, around the 50s, people figured out how to make glass that would not expand and contract at all. It was very expensive. So they thought they got it, and various four meter telescopes were made with this glass. But then there's another problem that comes. So it, it has to be thick to be stiff, and then it stores heat. And maybe that doesn't change the shape of the glass, but what it will do is the stored heat will come out as convection, and that spoils the image. So in fact, that whole generation of telescopes in the four meter class did not have very good images because they had a good shape, but the light was distorted because of heat coming off as convection. And the, the mirror would cool all night, so this was something that wasn't just there in the early evening, it would go on the whole, the whole time. So the answer to that, was to put your telescopes in a place where the temperature doesn't change very much. So it became very fashionable to put telescopes in places near the ocean or on Hawaii or whatever, because that would mitigate that effect. Um, and that got you somewhere, but still we were left with this, with this limit. Another limit uh, that people came up against was that the bigger the telescope goes, the bigger the enclosure you need to put it in, protect it from the wind. And so if you've been to Palomar, I mean, it's the size of a cathedral. It's an enormous building. It costs a lot of money. So in fact, typically, the building will cost as much or more than the telescope inside it because they got to be so huge. So those were the kind of ceilings that uh, limited telescopes. Um, this actually just shows you what this is an extreme case of where heated air is causing blurring. I mean, you see the sun, same thing from the roof of a car that's been heated by the sun. Here's the heat of jet engines. And you can see the image looking through the air, which has turbulent heat in it. It's completely messed up. And so that's the problem that astronomers fight if they have convection coming out of their big, heavy building or if they're big, heavy mirrors, then it spoils the image. So uh, the three of us then sort of have went and have been in, in somewhat complementary, or there's a lot of common stuff in the way that we've gone to address these problems. And I think Ray Wilson was probably uh, the first to uh, see a direction to do this, which is to not use hugely thick glass, make it thinner, but then the, the so that gets around the thermal problem to some extent, but then it's flexible and it's going to bend. So Ray's idea was, well, we'll look at a star image, we can analyze that for the bending, and we'll put in actuators that will then uh, continuously uh, actuate, push on the glass and get it back to the right shape. So that let you use thinner glass. So the eight meter mirrors in the VLT are only about eight inches or 20 centimeters thick and a lot of active correction on them. So there were two parts to that. One is to have actuators, and the other is to figure out how to measure the, from a star signal what it is you need to do to fix it up. Now, the, uh, another approach which Jerry Nelson took was uh, to get even a little bit bigger to 10 meter mirror out of very thin glass, only eight centimeters, about three inches thick. And the trick here was to uh, make the glass in a, in a lot of rigid pieces, stick those to steel, again, sense from a star what's going on, and then move the pieces around uh, to get the shape back. And then the, the third way that, that we've explored at the Mirror Lab at Stewart Observatory is to go um, put the glass, instead of a, a slab of a certain thickness, to actually form it into a honeycomb shape. Uh, because then you can combine great rigidity. This is, you know, many stiff things like airplane panels and many places are made as a sandwich with two sheets and honeycomb material in between. And the Hubble telescope mirror is made like that, but the technology to do it uh, limited you to a relatively small mirror, big in space, but small for what we want to do on the ground. So um, what we developed at the lab was a way to make uh, eight meters, 8.4 meter mirrors with this very rigid honeycomb structure. And it it's completely solves this thermal uh, convection problem because I think I've, I've got some pictures here. Uh, I'll just make the other point so I don't forget it. The other thing we did while we were 
Changing the mirror was, in fact, to make them deeply curved so the tube length would be short, so the building would be small to help bring the cost down. So we, those are the two sort of approaches that, that we've taken. So I, I uh, have a, my wife and I have a, a house down by one of the con still flowing rivers in Arizona. We went down a month ago, and there was a whole bunch of bees right on the kitchen uh, door. And then we went again a couple of weeks later. The bees are all gone, and they left these absolutely wonderful honeycomb. Really uh, gladdened my heart to see these perfect structures. <laughs> so this is what um, you don't see in the mirrors we make, but if you took a, a knife and cut through a cross section of the mirrors, and these are, this is an exact scale drawing of a cut through the six and a half meter mirrors that were made for Magellan uh, and the MMT. So there are two faces that are a little more than an inch thick. And then between, there are ribs of half an inch thick glass. So that there's almost nothing inside the glass. But it, it's the right recipe to give you a lot of strength for not too much weight. So the total weight of the mirror is only 20% as if it were solid. And most of that weight is in the two faces and not much at all in the ribs. But that gives you a wonderful, lightweight, stiff, structure, and the way we make it is that into each of those honeycomb cells of the hole in the, in the bottom, where actually we got all the molding material out of that hole. And so when it's in use, we actually blow air. We have an air conditioning system that is jetting quite forcefully air into each cell, and that very quickly brings the glass to be the exact temperature of the night air, whatever that is, and then you don't get this heated air boiling off the surface. And the result of that, uh, and I know I will have a lot of people in agreement here, is that the Magellan telescope make the best images of any telescope because we, we got rid of this part. Um, and we also, that curve there is relative to, I think every telescope mirror we made in the mirror lab is more deeply curved than any other mirror. And these have a f1.25, which means a 6.5 meters diameter and the light comes to a focus only eight meters above the mirror. So when you want to make a building and turn this, the building doesn't have to be too big. And that's a picture. The other view, so these are, this is the design we've used for the 8.4 meter mirrors, and it's drawn exactly to scale. I was amazed the bees were able to do those honeycombs and disappear in, in a short amount of time. We have to make every one of these we, we make a honeycomb block and then melt the glass around it, and every one of those 1,600 blocks has to be made on the machine tool and mounted in place and so on. So that's exactly the design of what we used in the large binocular telescope and that we're now making for the large synoptic survey telescope, the LSST, um, and for the giant Magellan telescope that we'll see a bit more of. So this is, uh, when you made the mold, you heat the glass and then you spin it in this furnace, which is 10 meters diameter, and you can look in and see the honeycomb structure glowing. So this is uh, what goes on every year or so in the mirror lab. Uh, we're making, melting the glass for the next uh, mirror to be cast. And I think the, uh, the next picture, this is a time lapse of looking at the glass, and this repeats now. Here's the chunks of glass, you heat it, it melts, and runs down into the uh, gaps between these blocks, and that's how in one go, you form this entire 27 foot diameter piece of glass that has the face plates and the thin ribs and the back plate. It's all made in one go, in that one magical uh, process. And uh, you watch with the TV very carefully this depth gauge here, which you can, is actually in inches, and it's stopped at about two inches. Uh, the very first 8.4 we made, it didn't stop. Uh, we watched on the TV and the level kept going down. We knew we had a leak, so uh, we opened the lid and cooled the mirror as quickly as possible. And sure enough, that there were places where the glass had run. There was no glass where the face of the mirror was supposed to be. But we calculated what had leaked out, and it was all there, thrown by centrifugal force to the edge of the mold. We calculated we lost two tons in the leak, 
So we carefully put two tons more of glass on the top, heated it up again, and we recovered the mirror. So we don't want to have to do that again. Uh, this is a movie now just sort of after the structure is cold and you get out the blocks. That's, that's just looking inside. That gives you a, a feeling of it. So it's cast glass. The surfaces are rough, uh, but that doesn't matter. The only thing that's really important is the front surface. We do polish the back so that we can look inside and make sure there's no damage. So that's a general view of the lab. We have two machines going at once. Usually one's grinding and one's polishing. And that's a picture of, I think, the uh, maybe the GMT mirror. Um, and you see, looking through the polished surface, you can see the honeycomb structure underneath. So this is the mirror that's the telescope that's now operational with two of these 8.4 meter mirrors in tandem. This is the large uh, binocular telescope. So, so here are the, this is one 8.4 meter mirror and this is another. And they're on the same stiff structure. So whatever you point at, you're pointing at the uh, both telescopes. So on most nights of the year, this is the big teles biggest telescope in the world because it's the equivalent aperture of 11.4 meters. Now, once in a while, the two Keck telescopes will gang up together, and then for that night, they're bigger. And once in a while, the four VLT mirrors will be ganged together, and then they become the biggest one. But most nights of the year, this is the, this is the biggest one. Now, what's been very exciting, and that's, oh, I just have to touch on this because some of you won't, won't have seen this. Phil Hins here has been building the instrument that combines the light from the two mirrors. And the great thing about this is that you have the potential. So the Hubble telescope is limited in resolution by its 2.5 meter diameter. Ground-based telescopes are limited in resolution by their 8.4, 10 meter diameter. So they have the potential to be four times sharper than the Hubble telescope. The LBT and the GMT has the potential to be 10 times sharper than the Hubble telescope. But you have to sort of mix the light waves from the two two mirrors to do that. This green thing is the gadget that sits between the two mirrors of the LVT and does that job. And just last week, uh, Phil Hens combined the light uh, in the infrared. And what you're seeing here is the sort of envelope of the bright thing is the normal resolution of one eight meter telescope. And when you mix the light together, then you get Young's fringe interference between them. And the the resolution that you get, which is shown in this cross section, um, is three times sharper than basically any other telescope at the moment. So we, we just started into that. At the moment, this is 10 micron wavelength. But as we bring adaptive optics to bear, then uh, we'll be able to move that wavelength down and get high resolution uh, um, at shorter wavelengths, where it gets to be very sharp. So one other thing, most uh, the, I guess I'm most notorious at the mirror lab for making these honeycomb rigid mirrors, but we've also had a lot of fun collaborating with Piero Salinari in, in Italy in making a completely different type of mirror. Um, this, this is only one and a half millimeters thick, and the point of this mirror is that when you've done everything right, and you get no convection off the mirror, and it's perfectly stiff, and you've got the shape perfectly set up, then you're still limited in the resolution. And, and this is because of turbulence that's high in the atmosphere that you can't do anything about. Newton actually knew about this already from his telescope. And he suggested that if you took your telescope to the highest mountains, maybe you would get out of this turbulence, and you would get to the limiting resolution of the telescope. But he, he wasn't right there. Unfortunately, things get better on mountains. But you're still left with a blurring that is way more than the fundamental resolution. This is why the Hubble telescope, even though it's little, does very good, unique work, because it's not being blurred by the atmosphere. We're, we're making headway in correcting for that on the ground. But at visible light wavelengths, we, we still can't do that. Anyway, so we've made now, every telescope has a big primary mirror, and the light is reflected to a second mirror, and then back down to a focus. 
And <clears throat> what we've done is put, by making the second mirror very thin and putting very fast actuators on it, so it can respond in a millisecond to change its shape. So this is like a funhouse mirror, except it can change its shape every millisecond. If you go that fast, you can keep up with the aberration caused by the high atmosphere and then recover sort of Hubble quality, only better images at the focus. Um, and that too, just recently at, at the LVT, this is the kind of mirror, um, what you see is, is just a, a shell, just looks like a solid piece of glass, but in fact, it's extremely thin and able to change its shape to, to overcome the atmospheric error. And this shows normal atmospheric blurring, and then when you put on the uh, circuit that closes the loop in this very fast response, then you see that what you were looking at was in fact a triple uh, star. So now if we, at the LBT or later in the GMT, if we take the two or the seven images from the mirrors that we have, put them together, then you'll make that another three times sharper. Um, so that's the, the thing that we're going after in the very big telescopes is to get a lot of photons, but also to get higher resolution by, by these tricks. So that's an image where now, this is exactly the kind of thing you want to see planets around other stars, which we're just beginning to see the most massive and self-luminous ones. But with these bigger telescopes, uh, we'll be able to see more normal telescopes, more normal planets, more like those in our own solar system. Okay, so the things that we're working on now, then we'll, I'll be done with uh, this part of the talk. So we're working on the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and this is a, we were very pleased that this got the top priority in the National Academy Review of Astronomy for the next decade. It uses three mirrors, is unique in having an enormous field of view, so it can scan the whole sky very quickly and to very deep magnitude. And uh, the mirror for that is actually is two parts. There's an annular outer part, which first collects the light, gets reflected to a secondary down to a center one that, that does the magic to give you this enormous field of view. And then the second one, uh, I'm gonna go past that because it's not a very good movie here. Uh, the one that's of more interest, particularly at, at Carnegie here, is the Giant Magellan Telescope. And now uh, that's going to have, as, as we heard, one mirror in the center and six around. And each of those mirrors is 8.4 meters or 27 feet. So the, the uh, thing is about uh, 75, 80 feet across. In fact, I had to blow it up. I, I thought that the artist had not put a man for scale in this thing, or a person. I should say, but if we just look at it a bit closer, uh, okay, this is, this is the person. <laughs> so um, this will be a wonderful tool. It's on a wonderful site that we know is good from, from the um, results we've already had from the Magellan telescopes from, and from testing there. It should give wonderful images because it's got these beautifully stabilized mirrors, but now spreading the mirrors in this case make a single uh, paraboloidal surface. That light then all comes to one focus. And up at the top here, we will have these magical one and a half millimeter thick mirrors. So that then the image that's reflected back down and comes down through this hole to the instruments then is corrected to the fundamental resolution limit of diffraction. So for any time we're operating in that mode, it will be 10 times sharper than Hubble telescope. All right, now, we'll, now we've got a little time to talk about something completely different. So the yellow bits here show where it's good to put telescopes because the skies are clear. Actually, you want mountains as well, but there are, we know there are plenty of mountains here where the sky is very clear, that's where the Magellan telescopes are, and in Arizona there's lots of sky and there's mountains here, and there are other places here. And if you're an astronomer, you will look at this as a place where you might think about putting telescopes, and if you're a solar energy person, you think about it as places where you can generate very efficiently solar energy by uh, direct 
radiation from the sun. There's enough to, um, you know, the solar energy and locally generated nuclear energy are kind of the mother log of energy. So if we're going to get off fossil fuel energy, uh, this is the re our main resource, right? Much, much more than wind and hydro and all these things. So there's enough here and plenty more than enough to satisfy all the energy needs of the planet without making any, any CO2. So um, where we are with renewable energy at the moment is that um, certainly for solar energy, it's not possible to make money by building uh, devices to make solar energy and selling the energy for 10 cents a kilowatt hour or five cents, whatever the, the rate is that you can get for it. So although solar energy is growing somewhat, it's still in terms of the fraction of US generation capacity, I think it's still only around a tenth of a percent. And basically nobody builds solar energy unless they're getting a government handout in one form or another. So this is not, as long as it stays that way, it's not going to be viable. You're not going to see fossil fuel replaced by solar energy until we can figure out how to make it cheap enough, basically so people can, can make money selling it without having to get, get a government handout. And then things could really take off. Um, I, living in Arizona, I wonder whether it's going to be that the Southwest deserts will in fact power the whole nation. Um, there's certainly all the energy there to do that. Um, and people are very pessimistic about transmission lines. But, you know, when there's enough money to be made, and I think of it being here in Andrew Carnegie's place, um, they rammed the railroads across this nation, right? Uh, and later on, we rammed the highway, the interstate highway across the nation. So I think if there's enough money to be made, that somehow it'll happen. And that's way out of my domain. But what I can think about is can we get the price down to the level where you can make money selling vast quantities of, of solar energy? So, the, and the threshold, you want to bear this in mind, is that if you can install power stations, solar power stations, at a dollar a watt, that is a gigawatt or a thousand megawatt facility, if you can build that for a billion dollars, which is a dollar per watt of power, then you can make money without subsidy. And it, and it goes something like this, that a, a, a gigawatt power station makes enough electricity in a year, you can sell it at a, for $115 million, even at five cents a kilowatt hour, which is wholesale rate. So it takes less than 10 years before your income will pay off the, the billion dollars that you paid out. So this is the sort of mantra, and it's now being accepted by ARPA-E, the new energy agency in the government, that you want to get to a dollar a watt. So the basic problem with sunlight is that it's dilute. The energy, you get one kilowatt per square meter of ground, and dilute source of energy is expensive to convert because if you convert it directly, then you need a lot of converting material. And the reason that fossil and nuclear and hydro are inexpensive is that they're concentrated energy. And once it's concentrated, you can con turn it from one form, like mechanical hydro or heat or something, into electricity inexpensively. So um, this is what really got me going, is that you understand on the most general grounds that if you can focus sunlight and not spend too much money on it, then you can break this... Uh, position we're in now and hope to make inexpensive electricity as cheap as, as uh, fossil and nuclear and so on. So that's what got me interested because I haven't spent my life figuring out how to focus starlight. I'm thinking, well, if I can just figure out how to focus sunlight and not spend too much money, then uh, maybe we can, we can break this uh, thing. So I mean, people were thinking about this also a uh, fairly long time ago. Um, so this was the state of the art and this kind of thinking in, in 1880. So people made parabolic uh, dishes, focused the light on a boiler, and uh, in this case ran a steam engine that ran a printing press. And believe it or not, most solar electricity in the U.S. 
has been made by essentially exactly this method, by trough, not paraboloidal, but a trough reflector that's parabolic cross-section, focusing on a steam pipe, and the steam runs to an engine, and the engine makes electricity. So in uh, California, for 20 years, there's been a 300 megawatt plant, which has been pretty successful. It doesn't get to a dollar a watt, but at least it's shown quite a bit of reliability and has been low enough that people have actually kept it going. So it's, it's, uh, what has been proven is that you can have mirrors out in the desert, and if you put the silver on the back, not on the front like we astronomers do, then in fact it will last for a long time. Um, so, thinking about this, we're thinking, well, can we do that kind of thing but really get the cost down? So, in the Mirror Lab a year or so ago, we, we made this uh, segmented, whoops, uh, segmented uh, dish uh, to see how well we could do in, in focusing uh, sunlight and thinking about how we might build something at, at very low cost. Now, you know I hate segmented mirrors, so in fact, we're not going to make any more of these. We're going to make, make them out of one piece of glass. But uh, this one at least gave us some practice. And it's much easier to make segments if you're only doing a small quantity. If you're doing a big quantity, you want to do a lot. OK, this is, this is kind of fun. So I say, don't try this with your own telescope. But if you have a three meter telescope, and you uh, have a quarter inch thick piece of steel and you focus the sunlight on it, then in 15 seconds you can make this hole the size of a quarter and the liquid steel pouring down. So it's, it's kind of fun. It's very good for impressing uh, visiting dignitaries who gave you money. <laughs> okay, so let's suppose we have a way to focus sunlight and it doesn't cost too much. What's the best way to convert it in electricity? And there's still a lot of people who are into sort of 19th century steam engines or Stirling engines, which are invented in the 1850 or something. But uh, what, you know, coming from the CCD and electronic detectors of astronomy, much more attracted to photovoltaic cells. And for a long time, they've been limited to about 20% conversion efficiency. And that's less than you can get from the very best thermal engines. They're about 40%. The most efficient coal-fired plants turn 40% of the heat into electricity. Well, what's happened recently is you can now get completely uh, no moving parts, a photovoltaic cell that will directly turn the sunlight into electricity. And the most recent one reported is 42.5% efficient, and they'll probably go to 50% efficient. So it seems to me very likely that what you'll want to use at the focus, having focused your light, will be one of these photovoltaic cells. And um, here's uh, a couple of handfuls of cells. And I'll explain in a minute why I bothered to put these cells in my hand. But there are eight cells here. They're each 15 millimeters square. And they're, they're of this type that you can now buy. These are in the sort of high 30s. But if that, I bought them a couple of years ago. If we buy some more, we'll be passing 40% conversion efficiency. So uh, photovoltaic cells are very, very fussy. So you've got to go from that enormous, brilliant burning energy at the focus of the dish. And then you have to spread it very uniformly, very evenly over the cells in order for them to work properly. Um, PV cells are like Christmas tree lights. That is, if one blows in the chain, you lose, you lose a whole lot. It's not quite as bad as that. But if one of them has less light than the other ones, then it will limit the current through the entire chain. So it really is like a chain as weak as the weakest link. So you've got to take, you've got to harness this chunk of energy at the focus and get it very uniformly spread over the cells, and hopefully in a way so that even if your cheap steel structure wobbles off a little bit, it doesn't wreck everything. So that's a very nice optical problem, very closely related to optical instruments that we've that we've made. So let me just summarize these, these cells. So they have higher conversion efficiency than anything. Because you use such a little bit of cell to make a lot of energy, they're in fact very inexpensive. The cells themselves cost 20 cents a watt. So that tells me I got 80 cents to build whatever it is that's going to put the, the concentrated light onto them. 
And there are other things for using direct sunlight. You, when you track the sun all day, you get energy all day, so it, it lasts longer than if you just have flat panels on the ground. Uh, there's a very small environmental impact because we don't have to blade all the ground. You just have to put the posts for the tracking things uh, in the ground. Um, and you have this incredible resource uh, with so much uh, energy, uh, as much energy as you want, and you don't use any water. So there's a bunch of things that are, that are very good. So there's 30 startup companies in this country who've noticed that these cells are there and they're cheap. And they're trying to figure out how to put light on the cells and not spend too much money. And most of them, their optical systems, most of you know what an amateur celestron telescope looks like, right? It's maybe about this big. So they use bazillions of little sort of celestron telescope-like things and gang them all together. So that to me is, you know, that's not, that's not the right way, right? We should use something, something bigger. And what we've... Uh, in terms of manufacturing, I'm absolutely sure that if we separate the big parts, the steel tracker and the glass reflector, from the fundamentally little part, which is where the little cells are, manufacture them separately, then we're going to get the cost down. And I think we really can get to the dollar a watt. So the, the new way that we've approached it is to separate for manufacture the, the big and the small pieces and then use proven uh, high volume ways of of doing it. So I think maybe I'll look at the, at the pictures before I go uh, through the, the words here. But we basically want to make big dishes inexpensively, package the cells. I'll, I'll show you some of how this goes. Okay, so at the mirror lab now, you can see both the LSST blank and the uh, GMT blank. Uh, you can, actually until we broke it recently, you can also see this piece of this piece of glass here, which is standard architectural window glass, float glass, except now we've taken it um, and put it in the furnace, and we actually held it from the four corners like a, like a handkerchief, and then you heat it, and then the weight of the glass stretches it out into pretty close to the dish that, that you want. Now, I want to use this material in this size as a starting point, because in a big float glass factory, rolls out a sheet of glass with this width, which is just over three meters, and it rolls out at one foot a second. So every 10 seconds, you get enough glass to make one of these dishes. So the plan would be to develop our process, or the plan is to develop the process so that we can incorporate it directly into the float glass factory. And so what comes out is not architectural glass, but every 10 seconds, we get one of these dishes. If you then silver those dishes, and use them to make electricity with these cells at the focus, um, then you're going to get um, six gigawatts a year of new electricity. So this isn't enough to save the planet, but it's a significant amount of electricity. Um, so you would need you know, a few dozen plants running like this, then you would make enough to gradually replace our electricity. Um, so one of the things, and there's too much detail on this, we, we are presently making these dishes uh, at around a one every couple of days. We think we'll soon get to every day, and then every eight hours, and then we change, we get to every three hours, we change the technology a bit, get to every 10 minutes, and then we get to every minute. Um, so we think we can get all that way by 2018, um, and that's the... Uh, uh, one of the main areas of research we're doing. I just wanted to show you this one, which is how you take that raw energy and spread it over the cells. The way you do that is that the focus, that where the steel was that was melted is in the center of this ball. The light comes in, and the ball forms an image of the dish on this surface here. And on this surface, you have a bunch of abutting funnels, sort of, uh, approximately square funnels, and they take and they reflect the light down to the cells, which are down here, and they it's constructed optically so that they do all get exactly the same amount of light. They do all make the same current, and we uh, so uh, we have this design. This is an artist concept of how you would use eight of these mirrors with these re receivers at the focus, and uh, where we are now that we've made. Uh, partial 
uh, mirror. We still haven't finished making a properly formed three meter mirror, but that should be in a few months. We've made a partial mirror and we've imaged it with a whole ball set up so it images not onto a full array of cells, but onto the same eight cells I was holding in my hands there. And uh, those cells uh, between them made 500 watts of power. Now, anybody who's put PV on their roof knows that you get about 200 watts from a big panel. So from those cells in, in my hands, we were making as much electricity as, as two or three full-size panels. So that's very encouraging, and we didn't melt them, we kept them cool, and we got good efficiency. And we've tested this new mount, which is made of, in a new way with very lightweight steel. Our steel tracking structure is five times lighter than the uh, one company that's most furthest advanced in this. But you just know that if you don't get the mass out, you'll never get to the, to the dollar a watt. So that's our space frame structure. At this point, it just had tarpaulins in it to check the wind uh, loading. Here's the thing operating. So we've got the four mirror segments here uh, instead of the full square. We've got the ball, which is receiving the light, and that's going on to the eight cells and making 500 watts of, of electricity. Uh, and this, in any proposal, you have to put this curve, which shows how the volts and the amps go and proves that you actually got the 500 watts and each cell is making 24 amps at 21 volts. They look just like CCDs where you would count individual photons, but when you put the sunlight on them, they make 24 amps of, of current. And our system has a very good tolerance to mispointing, which means we can use a lightweight uh, structure. Uh, this shows how the layout might be for put, putting these things in the ground and how to service them. Uh, this is our pie chart which says that we think we can build everything and assemble it for 80 cents a watt, and it's sort of based on reasonably well understood price of materials and, and manufacturing. You don't get this until you go at 1,000 megawatts a year, but that's where we're aiming at. Um, the one sanity check, and then I'll quit very soon here. So we know how much our units weigh, um, and if we can build them for the same price per kilogram that you can go to the store and buy a pickup truck, which is $10 a kilogram, if, you, if that's how much they cost, then that would translate into $1.60 a watt. And I, I think that our tracker units are actually much simpler to build than pickup trucks. Uh, we don't have to go at 100 miles an hour. We just have to turn once a day, and there are various uh, simplifications here. So it's not... Uh, it's not crazy to think that we can get by this mechanical structure to a dollar a watt. Um, so um, these days, if you go to the government for funds, as a university, they say, fine, but we want matching funds from industry. And I couldn't find anybody in industry who I really wanted to sort of share all this with, so I formed a startup company um, and got on, as you can see, on the cover of Biz Tucson, very enterprising photographer took this nice picture with, with one of the balls there. Um, so I don't think we need to see. I've talked about this. Getting scaling up the production of mirrors is a is a critical thing to convincing people we're going to get to this uh, gigawatt a year. So just I don't have any profound thoughts to to finish up with. But when the three of us got into uh, revolutionizing telescope, astronomical telescope design. It was at a time when the tradition of Newton and Galileo and Herschel and everybody getting in and getting their hands dirty, that had been sort of forgotten. And the astronomers tend to turn over making telescopes to engineers. And I think the reason we were able to revolutionize telescopes on the ground was that we put in all the smarts and all the learning and all the science and all the physics and everything to figure out the system anew, how to get around these problems of turbulence and so on. And I think now there's been an assumption in government a little bit that having made the cells, well, you should just hand this over to people who know how to make optics and steel, right? But that's where it's all being lost now. It's all being lost because those system things have not been 
thought through. So I think it's not only details of how you do glass, but it's really how to think through a complete system and address what the problems are that I find so exciting because everything I've learned in astronomy and more now, right, I can bring to bear on this absolutely critical problem. So I'm, I'm delighted for so many people, you look at global warming and you think, what can I do, right? What's to be done about it? Well, I've actually got something. I can at least try to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, for providing a really fascinating lecture. He was on every dimension. This was uh, really quite an exploration. We do have a few minutes uh, to provide for questions from the audience. There are microphones in either aisle. And let me invite uh, those who have some questions for Roger to uh, come to the microphone. And we'll, we, we have to close up in a few minutes, but let's get uh, some questions directed in. Uh, from a system point of view, uh, uh, if 50 percent of the energy is turned into electricity, the other 50 percent isn't. How do you keep the things from melting? How do you cool it? Or what are the cooling requirements? Um, okay, yeah, you have to work very hard to keep it cool, but it turns out that computer chips, when you run them hard, actually develop heat at about the same rate, and that's been pretty much sorted out. And automobiles also generate similar amounts of heat. So we've kind of combined uh, antifreeze automobile techniques, right, with computer techniques. The chips actually run 20 degrees centigrade above ambient, so they're, they're kept very cool. Please. Um, I guess I'm more interested in um, the uh, design and construction of large telescopes. And I was just wondering if maybe this book, the uh, telescope mentioned here, is, covers it, but is there any book that covers the design and construction of these very large telescopes? There's, there's a very good book by the, one of the other Cadley winners, Ray Wilson. In fact, there's a two-volume series, so if you really want to get into it deep, uh, you could look at uh, Ray's book. Uh, what's the title? Astronomical telescopes, or who, who remembers that? If you look up Ray N. Wilson telescopes in Google, right, it'll surely tell you. Roger, you might, uh, for the benefit of some of the audience, explain something that might be a mystery for them. When you showed the furnace, you showed it spinning, but you didn't explain why. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, if you spin water in a pan, right, it gets thrown up to the sides. And in particular, for the mirrors that we wanted to make that are very deeply dished so that they're short focus, so that the building is cheap, um, if you were to do the traditional method, which is to take a flat slab and then carve this glass out, you would end up removing far more glass than was left. So that cost you a lot of money to buy it and so on. So it's, it's much cheaper to go to the trouble of making the furnace spin. And then when the glass is liquid, you spin it at just the right rate so it takes the curve that you, that you want. I'm sorry I yeah. missed that. I've had the opportunity to actually see the system in operation. It's quite amazing. Please. Uh, Dr. Angel, to get back to the power plant, uh, what happens in a hail storm? <laughs> well, well, one of the reasons we, we like the glass route that we're going is that we're using glass in exactly the same thickness and mounted in the same way as the California plant that's been running for 20 years. And the answer is, from all forms of weather, you, you have a 1 in 300 chance of losing your glass each year. So there will be a repair rate to replace the glass. But that's an economic balance, right? That's what they've found is about the right balance between the cost of repairs and the cost of building it heavier in the first place. How many hours a day and over the year, how many days a year will you be able to generate electricity at, the, at a useful level? The, in the, so there are maps that are put out uh, by the National Renewable Energy Lab. And the good sites in, in California and, and Arizona run at about uh, seven and a half hours 
of producing a, the, the equivalent amount of energy as though the sun was shining seven and a half hours all day, every day. Now, in fact, obviously there are gaps and you have to have storage and, and so on, mixing different renewable energies to overcome that. But uh, the, on average, you get seven and a half hours averaged over summer and winter. Well, are you working on the storage, you know, the storage problem? Because when the sun sets, how do you store the electricity? Are you working on that problem as well? I'm, I'm, that's out of my range of expertise, but I looked at it long enough to reckon that it wasn't a problem in the sense that 20 years ago when nukes first came on to make electricity, they liked to run 24 hours and not stop. And so people were faced with, what do I do with all this power at night? So they built pumped hydro storage. And in the US, about 3% of the total generation capacity is actually in pumped water. So you, the, the nukes pump the water up at night, and then it comes down in, in the day. And people make money doing that. So there is uh, storage as another 30 gigawatts of this in Europe and a lot of experience. So I think in the end, or, or certainly initially, we should do offshore or wind, which mostly comes at night, and mix that with solar so you mitigate that problem to some extent. You can switch hydro, regular hydro, on and off instead of running it 24 hours a day. There's an analysis for California that says that just about does it. If you mix existing hydro, wind, and solar, you've got pretty much of a 24 coverage. You know, the other dimension in California is the peak load is during the daytime for mm -hmm. air conditioning when the sun's shining so that, uh, that you can pay for uh, more for electricity at those times. So exactly the times when you need the energy, the solar energy is available, whereas for wind it isn't. Mm -hmm. So solar is very attractive in the western part of the U.S. Another question. Uh, Dr. Angel, you, uh, my question is about efficiency. You mentioned that the... Uh, peak efficiency for the triple junction photovoltaics are in the low 40s. I think I also saw on one of your slides that your end-to-end -end efficiency in your last test last month was 25%. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak about the delta there and also what are your uh, near to medium term expectations for how that efficiency might climb? Yeah, the, the near term, I mean, that was real world, what we actually got, and we haven't coded the optics. We're not using the latest generation cells and so on. So the cells we actually have, under the conditions we're operating them, are about 31%, and we got 25 So I think right now we can go to the store and get better cells, and we can put better coatings on the, on the optics. So we're thinking that 30% end-to-end -end sun in uh, electricity out will be quite doable on a time scale of two or three years. And then as the cells get better, we can put in better cells. And the uh, cells or other parts of your design, are there any exotic materials that would therefore result in mining pollution? Um, well, the one thing about concentrator is that you use a thousand times less than the other guys, right? So it's, it's a very small amount of, of stuff in there. So uh, most of that is germanium, but I think uh, the, the little tiny bit that we use, as, as you saw, just a little bit to make 500 watts, means that we're not in a problem. A final question. Back to your giant telescope. The uh, mirrors around the edges, are they uh, 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 symmetrical, symmetrical, uh, or are they, uh, they cast to uh, uh, cast differently than the center one? They're, they're cast so that the curvature approximates as best you can what is a not at all a paraboloidal surface. Um, we, we then have to grind out the difference, which is a good fraction of, a, of an inch. Um, if I could just finish up. So this, one of the tricks of the lab is how you do that and get it accurate to a millionth of an inch to do this wacky shape. and. Uh, one of the reasons we're making this mirror before we got anything like the whole amount of money for the telescope is that this was the most critical thing to see that we could make this really wacky shape and know that we had got it right to a millionth of an inch and not make any mistake like some other telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> Carnegie has really been a great beneficiary of the skills that Roger Angel has brought to this craft and that, as he mentioned, the Magellan telescopes have the 
among the best telescopes, we say the best telescopes on, on Earth. Uh, it's in part of virtue of the site, but a lot of it is the virtue of the, the superb quality of the mirrors that uh, Stewart Laboratory produces. And we are counting on you delivering yet again as we uh, move forward with the Giant Magellan Telescope. And so we're very optimistic uh, that you'll have success there as well. So please join me in thanking Roger Angel for providing us a wonderful evening. And thank you all for joining us.